Hello there. Welcome to the Getty online speaker series for teachers entitled Redefining the New Media Divide, Addressing Social Media, Technology, and Media Literacy in our post-pandemic classrooms. I'm Darcy Beeman Black, your host, and I'm excited to introduce our guest speaker today. Today, Jesse Miller will help us fine tune how we think about the student culture of communicating in online spaces and how youth use technology. He will inspire us to reflect on how media literacy and digital citizen citizenship affect our teaching communities and how we might shift our perceptions to redefine how online tools are handled in the classroom. It has been a pleasure to get to know Jesse, and I look forward to each one of our conversations. I appreciate his genuine and thoughtful approach to talking about conventionally provocative topics in a solution-based way. Before it begins, I also wanna share a bit about his background. So Jesse Miller is a recognized Canadian authority on media literacy, social media education, and digital trends. Currently, Jesse is a lecturer at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. His work focuses on supporting new media literacies and developing curricula and business practices our technologies harmonize with, it, with our lives. He also focuses on our ever-changing social media engagement and trends in our connected reality of post-pandemic communications. He and his family live in British Columbia, where they work from home, learn in person, play online, and experience the beautiful province they live in by spending a lot of time outside. I will now pass things over to Jesse. Darcy, thank you for that introduction. Uh, a, a warm one um, where I feel actually very close to you in that regard because you took the time to be eloquent and, and introduce me to everybody in, in such a such a heartfelt way. And I do want to echo your sentiment. It's been wonderful not only getting the benefit of learning more about any teaching series um, and how to benefit education across our, our borders here, but also just the reality of where we are, um, the comfort of virtual learning. Uh, for those of you on today's session, um, you know, traditional professional development comes with coming into a convention hall and hearing a speaker on stage. And one of the things that really for me as an educator um, has been a benefit is more time at home because we get to do these sessions or use the technologies that sometimes become our chagrin in the in the classroom. Um, as a note, uh, coming to you from Canada, there are different perspectives sometimes in the way that we approach um, our politics and our conversations around safety in our schools and, and, and everything to do with raising our kids. But I think at our core, whether we're on one side of the board or the other, there is the, the harmony of raising children and giving kids the bed of education no matter where they're from in the world and and really recognizing each child um, and their capacities for learning and really kind of the things that give them the opportunities to grow as humans and so today as we dive in uh, I just want to give to you some perspective about myself and my work um, as an educator I've been delivering these type of presentations for over 15 years and and just as a note for teachers um, I focused negatively in my work at the beginning, um, focusing on how to limit kids' use of technology, how to protect them from the scary things on the internet with a lot of abstinence-based dialogue of don't go to this website or don't use this tool or keep your kid off social media as long as you possibly can. And as my work and my research and my experiences gave me more understanding of where young people were, I realized that damming up the floodgates was never going to be the answer. And so as we ventured into the pandemic, and just keep in mind here, I use a little bit of reference points to help all of us kind of conceptualize our conversation. In March of 2020, when we started discovering that people were going to be locked away, that we would not be able to you know, freely kind of go through our communities the way we traditionally had, um, schools very much bore the brunt of what the pandemic was going to do for families. And so where would schools be able to give education, technology, opportunities for kids to finish the school year, um, or when it comes down to it, just the idea of finishing core credits, that is overwhelming for families. But I also ask you to go back in time and ask yourself in, let's say, 1990 or 2000 even, what would the pandemic have looked like with our rudimentary internet at that time? What would it look like? 
like with up connections? What would it look like without smartphones? And if you could ask yourself how much Netflix you watched during the pandemic or how you were able to use some of the things in your home to facilitate work from home or learn from home, really, what would we have done 20, 30 years ago when it came to FaceTiming families or being able to communicate to loved ones using the joy of tech? text message, or unfortunately putting our kids in front of too many screens to kind of just kind of keep our own wits. These are the pieces that really do kind of interest me about what we did with technology while we had it. And now that we're kind of moving forward through the pandemic, what do we now tell kids about what they do with screens that may be seen as a negative, you know, too much time in front of screens or you're wasting your time. So the media literacy piece, I think we all have different perspectives of our, our right and wrong in our media dialogues. But the reality of it is your classrooms are where technology does come in, sometimes with the, your own want for it because the kids bring it from home. So as we go through and we discuss this today, I want to highlight to you how I got into this. And as I mentioned, 15 years of education turned into a lot of my work kind of coming to fruition because, hey, we've got kids now having to use tech to learn. And so when I started Mediated Reality, the conversation in schools about how we live and breathe in a world where we can facilitate face-to-face -face communication, but then we also struggle with somebody picking up a handheld device and we feel like they're distracted and we feel like that's that's their focal point. What does it mean to live in a mediated world where our reality is one, where it's a hybrid of the text message that's coming in, the email that's coming in, and as we raise children in that space, what needs do they have when it comes to conversing more and more about using these technologies in healthy ways? And so I thought that as we exit the kind of pandemic conversation of, you know, tech good, tech bad, how do we redefine this new media divide? Because one thing I'll tell you for sure is no matter where we are in the world, children helped parents. Children reset Wi-Fi. Children helped their grandparents get onto iPads and use these tools in healthy ways. And if you remember some of the footage of, let's say, seniors not being able to leave uh, facilities because, you know, the risk of COVID, you know, this idea of FaceTiming family, this idea of staying connected, this idea of healthcare workers making sure that families had iPads available to connect with loved ones that they traditionally would see. Like that was the tech piece that really did allow us to stimulate our connections. So in a lot of my work, I want to highlight a couple of points to you. I don't demonize technology at all. And I recognize that there are good ways of using it, but there's also the human convenience that we're forgetting. We text and drive because we find justifications for using the technology when we're operating a vehicle at 60 miles per hour, but we should be focusing on the road ahead of us. We find justifications when we go on vacation and we tell our children, go outside, enjoy this. I didn't pay for you to sit inside and watch TV. But we as the adult, we sit poolside and we check our iPad or our phone to see emails that are coming in or notifications on Facebook that have to do with things at home that we just paid money to pay for them. So in our connected world, when we think about where we're going and the way we use these tools, I very much never really thought my job would exist because when I was in high school, my ex my job didn't exist. Uh, there was nobody telling me, hey, in 20 years, you'll be an educator teaching kids about Snapchat or Instagram. Instagram, or hey, you'll be supporting parents about how many hours a day their kids should be using individualized technologies that allow them to message and view and engage and create. And so when people ask me, what do you do for a living? I, I don't really have an answer because it is so, so far fetched from the idea of having a job. But I bring a lot of my family into the conversation. And I just want to highlight I grew up with very professional parents who are, are, are medical uh, surgeons who reconstruct teeth and people's smiles. And my mother is a leader in her community. And I grew up with a strong uh, maternal person who not only empowered me to be a well-rounded and aware young man, but also the idea that she was strong and that she was in charge. And my dad was kind of behind the scenes. And one of the things I want to highlight here is that I've had the benefit of being able to educate and work with my family and say things like, hey, I understand some social media issues within the dental field. And that's where I can kind of talk to my parents about it. But most interestingly, my dad doesn't know what I do for a job. And I grew up with the idea that you go to university, you get a four-year degree, you then go and specialize in something, and then somebody hires you to do something or you employ yourself, because that's what my parents did. But if I open up a conversation and say, hey, dad, I make a living talking to people about ways to keep their children safe on the internet, but also how to empower their children to be better users and creators of the internet. He's one of those old guys who says, well, at least you're not asking me for money. But if I look at this idea of what I do in my job, 
The idea of memes and how they affect people, communicating not only using text, but using animated files that give us pop culture references, or the idea of safe sharing spaces where people's respect and privacy is something that we highlight as a priority as opposed to a secondary. And this idea of normalization and culture, I don't want to demonize tech, but I do want to hold somebody accountable when they're not following the rules or expectations of a space that we've asked, can you please put your technology away? So today, as you think about the way we're using tech in this facility, I'm coming to the Getty, not only virtually and in presence, but I'm also about maybe 2,000 miles away. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing when it comes to how we can participate, how we can communicate. So at the very bottom of the slide where it says that I support with education and resources, those who may not fully embrace using tech, unfortunately, the pandemic taught us in certain ways we have to. But at the same time, we can't forget our humanity in that space when we're choosing to use these tools to connect with one another for purpose. And so today I thought what we would do is just kind of highlight how we get to this spot. And for me as an educator, I don't, I don't teach in a traditional K through 12 school, but I do a lot of work with K through 12 schools around North America. And so when I visit a community and I see my name and lights, like there's a little bit of pride there for me. And I can send it to my dad and say, hey, dad, look, you might not get what I do for a living, but people are interested in my work. That piece right there kind of brings together something interesting for me. How do I teach internet safety when I don't know how you as a person have concerns about it? So if I walk into a room, let's say of 50 educators, and I say, what do you want to learn today? How can we participate with one another? I might have one parent who's also a teacher who says, hey, I want to know more about what my kid does in a video game. Can you give me some tools and resources? Sure. But we can't allocate the entire presentation to that. So using a small amount of time to kind of talk about the conceptual ideas of where kids are, some of the concerns that we have as parents, no matter where we are in the world, and at the same time, bring it together so that we can go, internet safety, what can we do to better support a child today? That conversation has to start with you and your child. How old are they? What are their concerns about being online and talking to you about that, whatever they're, they're, they're doing or whatever they're experiencing? And you as a parent, where are your values in that space? Do you use the technology as a pacifier, as a babysitter? Or are you participating with your child and trying to learn as much as you can about what they're interested in online? Because that's how we raise media literate kids, by having conversations about the medias that they participate in. Those conversations right there are, are where you as an educator might want to consider your students. Each student's going to have a different interest. Each student's going to have a different idea of what they like to do online. But if we only kind of blanket it with internet safety, let's protect you from predation, we're really forgetting about the beauty that the communities that we can create online are and how they can be safe and how they can be inclusive and how they can be places where we learn about one another and we really get away from the polarization that affects all of us today. So when I pulled up to this community center and you see my name and lights, one as a note, my name is misspelled. It happens all the time. But if I have to think about my audience and say, internet safety, what's my messaging today? That's where I have a moment to really reflect and say, why did these people come here? What are they looking to learn? And how can I best support them? But I will be honest with you, it's not always clear. Because sometimes when I pull up to a school or an event, the signage is a little bit different. So for this event here, when I pulled around the corner, and again, this is a high school of about 2,000 kids, and I see my name correctly spelled, but I see a very different topic than the idea of what I'm going in for. Right there, that conversation becomes one of, what are the people in the audience looking to learn? And so, yes, I can focus a little bit in my conversation about hypersexualization and where young people are and what our concerns are, but the laws in one place may be entirely different than the laws in another. And so just because I'm there doesn't mean my expertise fits into the community values. It doesn't mean it fits into the law or the way that the conversation starts with, be careful what you do on the internet because police will get involved or because you'll get suspended from school or whatever it be. But if we look at human beings, how do we support a victim of sexualized violence in a digital space? How do we make sure they have the tools and resources that they can not only access, but talk about without fear of judgment? Because that's where we are in these spaces. Because none of us growing up with Polaroids or rolls of camera film would ever have taken photos where we had to face a third party to get the end result. But that's where kids are today. There is no third party. There is no photo lab where the roll of film gets developed and they pick it up a week later. They live in an on-demand culture where you can send a photograph of anything, any video, any piece of information at light speed 
because that is literally the society and culture we have created. Our consumership of telecommunications has made it that we believe this is the society we need. Now, whether it's hypersexualization, whether it's a school fight, whether it's just a photo of their best friend and they send it to somebody, that's the world we've created. Now, not every kid has equal access, but when it comes to the stories that we focus on, we tend to only focus on the negative. We don't necessarily focus on the great things that kids are doing online. And that's where we have to kind of meet the middle ground. So within that, when we think about where we are, I wanna to highlight to you a couple of value points. One, the majority of you on the call, I'm assuming spent some time in the 20th century where you remember the rudimentary ideas of communications, the phone that was connected to the wall, the idea of watching television because you watched that one channel because it was the only channel you had and the fancy kids down the street had cable, but that was only 12 channels, not 700. But as a kid who grew up with just terrestrial antenna TV, because my parents didn't think that we needed to spend extra money on extra shows we weren't gonna watch, I think it's really interesting to consider where we are because we're now 23 years into the 21st century and we're still sometimes valuing this idea of scaling back. Now in the values of communication and family and friends, there is a space for technology balance. But in the world of work from home, in the ideas of being connected to your email and being responsive to your employer, we unfortunately have structured this idea of 24 hour communications. We have prioritized it. And so today, if you left your home and you forgot your cell phone, you would prioritize how you choose to go back to get it. And just for a moment, consider how much information we put into our cell phones, how much we rely on that space as adults. We unfortunately tell kids that they don't need to consider that until they're older, but they structure and they prioritize their social engagements, their participations, their fear of missing out in a space that we created, not one that we wanted to have for them, but one that we built and we said, this is a value. So in that, if we don't prioritize teaching kids about the world that they communicate in, and we only say, hey, put your phones down because you don't need it right now, I just want you to consider how that would translate to your own workday. If you had an employer who took your personal phone away because they said, hey, for the eight hours you're here today, we can't trust you with this, what does that mean when it comes to our adult learners? Because as a, as a university educator, I don't highlight and tell my students time for your phones away, but I have to structure their use of technology based on oversight. So in that, when we consider the idea of where we are, for 2023, I kind of want to highlight to educators, the more that we focus on key pieces, digital identity. Who are you online? What does it mean to tell the world you exist? What are your digital rights? What type of person are you online when it comes to your conduct? Do you have the right to be horrible? Do you have the right to spew hate? Do you have the right to operate online without those fears of somebody targeting you? And in that space, the more we open up community conversation in our schools, we ask kids questions like, hey, what are your digital rights? Does somebody have the right to take a picture of you and share it online? What does it mean for somebody to do that in public versus inside of a public school where in that space you are protected as a student? These are all questions that then turn into digital literacy. Do you understand how the app that you're signing up to is going to use your information? Do you understand that that photo that you thought might disappear actually doesn't disappear? And so the more that we highlight to young people, it's great to be on social media, but social means interaction with many. Professional means, hey, look at me. I'm ready for something that you're going to give me an opportunity for. And personal means personal. That's not for the world to see. That's for somebody that I'm choosing. And hopefully they're respecting me in that space. The more that we do that, we then turn into safety. What does safety look like when it comes to respecting boundaries, knowing our connections? Just because you have lots of followers online does not mean you're popular. You're a child and you're letting somebody pay attention to you that we don't know who they are. That seems like a concern for boundaries and red flag behaviors. So the more we focus on the idea of security of self, protect yourself, unfortunately that backfires. But starting with the individual and saying, where are your rights? Where do you want your respect to fall? Where do you want your boundaries to be something that other people acknowledge and adhere to? That then turns into a communal value of security of self. Because the reality of it is here, most of us, when it comes to our passwords, when it comes to our logins, we don't want to put the effort in to maintaining the safety and security of it. We just like the convenience, which is why the majority of people, especially on this call, probably have four digit codes for their bank code or their, their credit card code, and all very similarly attached to things like children's date of birth, 
anniversaries, all the things that criminals like to use to leverage that power. But in that, the communication network spaces where your employer says, hey, once in a while, we need you to reset your passwords. We need this to be difficult. The majority of us meet that with some kind of hesitation, like, oh, I can't believe I have to do this. But at the same time, we then negate the value that we put onto kids. Should they then take extra steps to protect themselves? Should they been efforting to be better with these tools? And as it comes to digital citizenship, we ask a lot of young people when it comes to bullying, when it comes to targeted harassment, when it comes to the idea of being good digital citizens. But if we even look at our own adult communications, look at the Facebook pages you participate in, look at how quickly the vitriol kicks up because somebody doesn't want to see another person's opinion or viewpoint. The hard part there is we now actually have more adults who are actively investigated by law enforcement for their conduct online than we actually do young people. And the reality here is that schools still play a huge role in how young people are policed. But the thing is, is that the issues start in schools. And so if we consider what COVID did to us as people, I think you have to keep in mind here that technology did get us through. But for years, I've had educators, parents ask me questions like, should kids even be on social media? And to be fair, this is a great question when it comes to a headline that we can source from the internet. But the reality of it is, is that when we look at some of these articles and some of these opinion pieces, we forget that they're not backed up by science. And so when a parent has a blog or when somebody is writing an article that's sponsored by another group, you have to really consider for a moment that their opinion is where we've, we've rest a lot of our values around whether or not kids should be online. And opinions are great, but unless they're backed up by here's some data, here's some information, here's what we know based on years of empirical uh, science. What does it mean for us to ask healthy questions about kids and the internet? So I'll start with this slide. Should your child have a social media account? That's a great question. And if it were applied to my family, I have children in different age groups. So again, what does it mean to highlight yes for one child versus no for the other? But as we progress through and we consider whether or not social media is good for kids, whether it's smart, Around 2016, 2017, we started seeing some good data because we now had a generational shift in how kids use these tools. If we only looked at kids from 2009 and their use of Facebook, we'd be very limited in understanding whether or not middle school age kids should be on social media. But we take a 10 year run up and go towards 2017, 2018, 2019, we now have groups of kids who have been on Instagram, Snapchat, all these things where they've gone from sitting at home in a, in a computer to now being in front of their parents and being on their parents' mobile plans and the ideas of the mobile plans now taking them outside the home. And so we started seeing really good data saying, wait, children who are 11, 12, 13 years old, we have hormonal changes, we have community changes in the sense of peer groups and schools. And what does it mean for these kids now to be in a 24-hour communication culture where that overwhelming behavior might not actually be good for the developing brain? So if you see the sub headline here where it says tweens brains are simply too immature to use social media appropriately, yes, 100%, I'm on board with you there. But I also ask you as the adults, how many of you have an adult who you know in your life, their brain is too mature to use social media appropriately? The thing here is, is not whether or not the person is mature enough or not, it's whether or not they understand the scope of what they're doing the range of their voice and how quickly something they say online can become something that is detrimental to their everyday lives. So the more that we think about how we use these tools, I do want to highlight to you that kids are pretty savvy with this, but around 2019, we actually started getting some really good data that showed that some of our fears around kids and screen time, kids and, and their use of social media was actually over overhyped, inflated, and sometimes came with this kind of viewpoint that as long as we protect them, they're going to be okay. But the question there becomes, okay, you've protected your kid from social media until they, let's you know, say, you know, they're, they're 16, 17 years old, but as they now venture into college and they become a university student, like where did they kind of learn to make some mistakes in that space? Where did they get the benefit of making a mistake on a small scale versus a large scale? So in that, when we look at some of the things that kids have doing are doing with the technology that are beneficial, 2019 actually showed that if we change our approach in asking the questions that kids use when it comes to, hey, how much time do you spend online? As opposed to, hmm, let's talk about what does it mean for you to use these tools for the purpose of school and for the purpose of friendship and for the purpose of entertainment? 
if we start subdividing it, we found that kids actually in pro-social participation were doing really great things with this tech. They were growing communities. They were becoming more diverse in their understandings of the world. They were also more tolerant to differences because they were engaging with kids in different parts of the world using these great tools and learning that not every kid is kind of like them, and that's okay. But within that, once we hit 2020, we actually lost a lot of that really good data and research because now we took them out of those spaces where we had that balance. And now we started pushing them into a space of, guess what? You have to be at home and you have to be online. So today, when we think about this idea of where we're going, I want to highlight this really great slide. And I'll tell you why. Because if I present this to a group of middle school kids, grade eight, grade nine, these kids are going to love this slide. They're going to be cheering, going, yes, I can go home, but I can tell my parents, I saw a guy at school today and he told us that another person who's smart, they need to, they, we need to play more video games. We need to do more things. And the parent is going to hate me because the parent is going to see this slide and say, no, no, no. My child already plays too many video games. I have all sorts of conflict. I have so, so many issues with my child. And again, I don't know if anybody on the call has a philosophy degree. But when it comes down to the employability of philosophers, there's not a lot of jobs out there that are really kind of hiring big money. So yeah, maybe a parent sees this and says, oh, yeah, of course they're going to say that. But the thing is, this doctorate in philosophy, who's also a clinical psychologist, this person, uh, Dr. Shapiro, highlights and says, hey, parents, it's not whether or not screen time is good or bad. It's whether or not you're sitting down and playing the video games with your kids. It's whether or not you're talking as a family about some of those influences they see. It's whether or not you're talking about the negative message that their, their friend sent them, and you're there as a supportive person to participate in their lives as an extension in the oversight place. Because if they can then talk to you about the media literacy issues, the gaps in understanding, the violence they may see, the language that they may see, they now have a trusted person they can rely on. And any kid who's had a negative experience on the internet where they've let it kind of roll into something bigger and bigger and bigger most often when they're asked by a principal or a police officer, hey, why didn't you come and talk about this sooner? They are fearful that the technology is going to be taken away or there's going to be some negative consequence for them getting into a problem that they didn't create. So if kids know that there's a safe space in their home, in their family, in their school community, that they can talk about something, this is where the technology balance comes in. And again, it's not more as an individual, it's more as a group, it's more as a family unit, it's more as a learning experience. So we can talk about it, take away some of the stigma, and take the power away from the people who use this technology for bad. And so today, as you kind of participate in this space, I want to always go back in time and highlight, hey, we're all adapting. These technologies are new. The technologies themselves, like they're part of our harmonized everyday life. But the reality of it is most of us don't really know how they work. We don't really caring in any way, shape, or form how they work. We just want them to. But I want to go back to August 1941. Now, this is Dr. Mary Preston of San Francisco, California. Now, she was tasked with the idea that all these radio horror shows that children were listening to on the radio, and when they went to the, to the movies and they put down a nickel or a dime to watch one of these movies that they could see, that this would be a negative for children. And if you look at the sample size, like the sample size is not large, but the same fears exist at that time, as they do now when it comes to, oh my goodness, they're hearing horrible things on the radio, they're going to become more violent. Oh, they're watching these movies that are going to change them and turn them into delinquents. The thing of it is, is that if you grew up with terrestrial broadcast at home, you were still very much garnered access to whatever it was you're watching based on communal censorship, the idea that it was approved to be on TV. And for those of you that grew up at home where you maybe had HBO, you know that because parents paid for cable, you got a little bit more of the spicier stuff. But the idea that something comes into our homes and it's unregulated, that's where this fear in this study was when it came from radio broadcast. So as we go through and we think about the idea of our technology, if you can remember getting CDs as a birthday gift or, or a holiday gift, and then there was that explicit lyrics on the, on the, on the outside warning you that the language on, on the disc may not be appropriate. That's where we have that oversight, that idea of how to protect our children. But the internet took all those boundaries and lifted it. So our kids now live in a world where they don't have to ask the awkward question about what does a word mean. They can go and Google it. And I guarantee some of you today, you've had that incident in your own life where you've heard your kids say a word. And you're like, where in the world did they learn that? Spotify. Instagram, their friends and text messaging, the boundaries of communication have been lifted. And I'm okay with that, but I want to know context. 
So if my children are prepared to use language that I would deem to be inappropriate or society would be deemed to be inappropriate, tell me why you're using that word. Do you even understand how that word can affect somebody? Or do you understand the scope of it? And the hard part there in those conversations is that we all know that paternal feeling of now I got to kind of go talk to my parents and get in trouble. But if it's not met with a consequence of negativity, but a, hey, let's further the conversation. Let's add a little bit of literacy to you so you understand that that word, yes, you may have seen it in a movie or on a YouTube channel or whatever it be, but here's how it affects other human beings. And the more that we consider this idea of, hey, what negatively impacts kids, let's dive into some of those big themes that we have concerns about. So with tech, video games, video games and violence. Do video games that have violence create violent children? Well, evidence shows that it doesn't. The majority of kids who demonstrate violence in schools see violence in their homes. The majority of kids who choose violence as an avenue of solution see it in their sibling rivalries, or they see it in their paternal structures where one parent chooses it as a tool as opposed to, hey, let's have a conversation about this. But one of the things that we have to consider here is that when we look at the way that violence affects school communities, as an outsider looking in, I know that school violence affects your school communities entirely different than it does mine. But the reality of it is, is about it is about access to weapons. It is about unassessed mental health care. And so in that space, when we look at the ideas of kids in video games, kids all around the world play violent video games. It doesn't mean that every single one of them looks to a weapon to hurt somebody else. So if we then start expanding and we look at some of those big stories, the big stories that affect our communities, Sandy Hook, well, the shooter in that event did play video games, but played Dance Dance Revolution did not favor for uh, uh, first person shooter games. So when we take away the narratives, when we took, take away all the lobbying, we take away the advocates for whatever, we have to look at the data. And the data itself tells us that kids are gonna do stupid things. Sometimes they're gonna sit and stand on milk crates and sometimes they're gonna go and steal things. But from my community where these were the big issues coming out of the pandemic going, wait, the kids were just not allowed in school for a year and now they're coming back and stealing things and filming themselves doing this. Let's blame TikTok. TikTok is the current flavor to blame. It used to be Snapchat, it used to be Facebook. There's always gonna be a social media platform to blame. Sure, there should be accountabilities and regulations in that space. But just because somebody does something, films it, and puts it on the internet does not necessarily mean that the medium is to blame. So within that, when you consider the idea of how our kids behave in digital spaces, I want you to consider that we are leaders in that space. And if you choose to check your phone as a primary at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, that's where our children are going to think, that's what I should be doing as well. If you're driving and you're on a highway and you're driving at 65 miles per hour and you're choosing to send a text message and you know it's against the law where you live to do that, your children see you do that, which means they see that the law is arbitrary and only applies to you when it's based on convenience. But when it comes to the idea of maybe we have to hold each other accountable, do they feel safe in speaking up and saying, hey, mom, dad, you're driving right now and you're not really paying attention and I don't feel safe. Will that be met with a safe understanding of you're absolutely right that I should lead better. And so today, as we think about our kids, social media itself is an amazing tool. It brings us together. It sometimes divides us. But the reality of it is we as human beings sometimes let those influences guide us. So within that, when we think about the things that have really made the internet a wonderful space, the idea of bringing people together, the idea of horrible things happening on our planet, but the thing is social media shows us exactly what we could do to help people. So today, as you think about this, I recognize that we're starting our conversation in California, but as a person who's not there, I think about some of the stories that come out of California, and I go back in my own childhood, the earthquake in San Francisco and Oakland. I remember watching that footage on broadcast television and thinking to myself, wow, could this happen here? But the thing is, would I have experienced it the same way if I only saw the pictures in a newspaper? Over the past two weeks, watching the events in Turkey and Syria, and not only seeing broadcast but social media content that's created by people who are trapped, it encourages me to want to help in my own community as fast as I can to do whatever it is I can, starting from my pocketbook out. So social media itself is a wonderful tool. We've all seen the divisiveness. We all know how it can affect our kids when it comes to bullying and negativity in those spaces. But there's always going to be something new. So what I'm encouraging you to do as educators is not focus on, hey, I need to know everything about everything that kids are doing online. But let's start with human behavior, because if a person can bully a human being on Facebook, they can equally do it on TikTok. 
If a person can bully somebody on Instagram, they can equally do it on Snapchat. The medium itself is not the problem. The human behavior is. So what I encourage you to think about as an educator is don't worry so much about what the kids are trending on. Like you want to be cool, you want to fit in that space, dive in a little bit, but get them to be your educator. Get them to be the ones who tell you, all right, tell me something interesting you learned on TikTok this week. Tell me something interesting that you learned on Instagram and look for that empowerment piece. Because the more that kids understand that they're empowered to talk about some of the things they do online, the better they're going to be. So as we go through, I just want to highlight here, and I'm going to rapid fire a couple of slides, a couple of key pieces. Good balance matters in anything we do, whether it's riding a bike, walking, having a conversation with people. Yes, we can hear them, but are we listening? When it comes to tech, same thing. Are you present? Are you participating? Are you using the tech to move yourself forward? Or is the distraction of the tech holding you back? And as we think about our kids and how they use these tools, I always ask children, hey, how do adults use social media? And the best part for me is when I go to an elementary school and I have children say, oh, 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 and their hand goes up and they want to tell me all the things that adults in their life do with the internet. It is a goldmine of jokes and references that I get to use later on. But it's also somewhat disheartening because I have young people who tell me I fight for attention from parents who are too busy texting. I I fight for attention because my parents are too busy looking at something online and they don't acknowledge or see me. And in that space, as much as we critique kids and say that they're addicted to these tools, tools and everything else. Again, we are the leaders in that space who do not live up to our own expectations. And that causes divides in our own relationships, our own families. Because yes, you're watching a family movie, but there's one adult sitting on a couch looking at a phone because the movie is not worth their time. And they're forgetting the family participation is the key. So within that, when we consider what our kids do, I always ask this question, what is social media worth to you? Because in that, I can give you two examples of our currencies. My Canadian dollar is worth a little bit less than your American. But one of the things comes down to is dollars. And if you remember, let's say 1999, when sending a text message cost 10 cents per message. In my country, the average Canadian teenager sends and receives almost 6,600 pieces of digital technology or digital communication a month. And so that's 6,600 in, let's say, a text message and a direct message. If parents were getting a bill for $660, be limiting how they're trying to automatically use these tools. But we have issues because of the free use, because it doesn't cost anything. And the end cost is reputation management, suspension, uh, uh, focus and sleep. And when it comes down to it, relationships. But if we only applied economics to this, I highly doubt the majority of you would follow a day to use Instagram. I highly doubt you would spend money to look at all the garbage that people put on Facebook because they just have an opinion and they want to put it out there. So asking young people, what's this worth to you? What's the value? Sure, connection, family, friends, but would you pay money to do it? And if the answer is no, that's the reflective piece. That's the starting point for you. Because as an educator, you want your kids to think critically. You want them to move forward. And so I highlight here that, yeah, 2020 did change the way we talked about being online and offline. Online meant, hey, I'm working from home. I'm in this space and my life is now part of my work in a very, very interesting way. But we can't ignore the values that have been tested over the past couple of years. And in that, when we think about how technology helped us weather the storm, I recognize that having good tech meant kids got good access to good education. And I think the majority of you as, as educators recognize that as well. There were a lot of gaps in how young people had reliable internet, reliable technology. And if your school gave tech to kids to try and kind of bridge that gap, good. But where are we doing that without a pandemic? Where are we doing that to really assess how kids use these tools to move themselves forward as a group of learners, as opposed to being pacified so they'll sit down and eat some food. Because when we think about kids in tech, we always think about this idea of a reprieve. So here's where I'm asking uh, as educators to kind of take this step forward. How can we improve digital citizenship as we move forward through and post the pandemic? Do we want kids to be more resilient against misinformation? Do we want them to minimize their connections and grow this organic group of people they can, can rely on? Because when I meet kids and I ask them, hey, are you in a group chat? How many people are in there? Do you even know who they all are? We hear things like, no, I'm just a part of a group and there's like 50 people talking. I don't know who half of them are. So why are you there in the first place? Because if I physically dragged you into a conversation and demanded you to participate with 70% of people you don't know, you'd probably have a hard time with that. But what makes it easier in the group chat? So today, as we kind of consider our use of these tools, 
I want kids bridging the divide of language. I want them bridging the divide of di differences. And if I can use a phone to Google Translate anything from English to Spanish, English to French, or whatever the language is that's causing somebody to have a hindrance, that's where the beauty of this technology comes in. But for young people, the idea of, oh, I'm going to miss something, this is where we have to look at our best practices. And our best practices start with educators asking great questions like, hey, what are kids doing today online? Which applications are they interested in? What does it mean to have proactive conversations versus reactive ones? And I cannot tell you and emphasize how disheartening it is to go to schools that only ask me to come in because they've had a negative event. Yeah, we had some kids send some inappropriate photos. So we need you to come in and give them their best practices. Okay, where was that when they were in grade, grade seven, grade six? How can we make sure kids are ahead of that so they can make a good choice when that negative opportunity is in front of them? But the one thing I want to highlight here, and especially for those of you who have your own children at home and you juggle kids at school, be realistic. And the thing is, educators are really realistic. We know that kids use you know, negative language choices. We know they can be horrible to one another. And sometimes we have parents in that they're like, well, how come you can't control this better? You try and control 35 kids that aren't your own. I have a hard enough time, time controlling two that I that I that I have to be responsible for. So in that space, why can't we be better, safer spaces for our kids? Why can't we be a place where they can come and say, hey, I'm having a really hard time because I sent a photo, I was participating in something, I feel unsafe, somebody's threatening me. And the thing is, the more that they're prepared to open up dialogues in a safer space, the more that we can take the problems and offer solutions as opposed to consequence. So today, as you consider part of that conversation, I'd like to pivot really quickly here into a thing that I very much value, and it's digital consent. The idea that we ask for permission, we look for agreement, because we talk about consent when it comes to their physical bodies and the relationships they have. But the majority of children today, no matter where they are, have had adults in their life aim digital technology at them and take photographs without seeking permission. Which is why when we think about these conflicts our schools have, oh yeah, photos start in the change room or start in the hallway or video exists. Nobody's ever considering, hey, do you mind you know, if I take this photo? Do you mind if I share this? So when I ask young people, hey, what does it mean to kind of have these tools? Kids say things like, oh yeah, we were told in an internet safety presentation, like, yeah, you might get arrested for a photograph that's, uh, that's inappropriate. Okay, but why? Just because somebody sent it to you? Did you ask for it? Did you want this photo in the first place? This is something that's controlled based on law. So what does it mean for you now to be in possession of it? Are you scared to talk about that because you've been told that if you even have it, you might go to jail? See, the hard part here is when we ask kids, hey, do you mind if I take a picture of you? Are you comfortable if I film this? Hey, do you mind if I post, post this on social media? When we start that in our homes, they can then learn how to advocate. And if kids can advocate and say, you know what, actually, I'm not feeling great today about myself. I'm not feeling great about my skin. I really don't want that photo circulating. Do you mind not taking the photo? That idea of acceptance, that idea of respect, that then becomes the idea they can take into a classroom and say, hey, you know what, I appreciate everybody wants to be in this photo. I'm not feeling great about myself. Do you mind if I step out? And the more that kids can learn how to advocate for themselves in that consent space, that then applies to other things like group chats. Hey, do you mind if I add you to a conversation? There's going to be a lot of people there you don't know, but you know where are you in that idea of wanting to be in there in the first place? No, I really don't want to be in that group chat. Thank you for asking me, but I'd rather not participate. That consent, that agreement, that understanding. If it snowballs there, and I apologize for using snowball. I know some of you are in California, not necessarily an issue, but it is snowing where I am. I do want you to highlight that as an idea of kids learning how to use these tools. And again, if we minimize you know, the idea of conflict and focus on success, that's where we as the adults in the room, we can really then take education to another level. Because social media concerns exist in our homes, they exist in our schools, they exist in our communities. But the more we meet it with education and media literacy conversations, the more we can start saying, okay, we have disagreement. You believe something online, I believe something online. Here's where we have a consensus, let's meet the middle ground. Yeah, you didn't want that photo to be taken, but unfortunately somebody did. It's been uploaded. Let's figure out a way to kind of minimize that impact. The more we can do that, starting in our workplaces, starting in our homes, this is the way that we can then change how we all talk about the issues around the internet that affect us all, like photos that travel too far or like comments or screenshots that affect somebody negatively. And that means that we can kind of get ahead of the trends and we're not necessarily paying attention to the, the news at 11 that's talking about the worst thing that kids are doing online today. 
Now, as a couple of points here, as our, you know, we kind of edge towards closing and some q and I want to highlight here that we're all struggling with communications balance. And I don't know if you've kind of dedicated yourself to paying attention to me for the past hour, but the thing here is that if you've also been able to juggle some something on your phone, maybe you've got Netflix on in the background, maybe you're eating at the same time, we all juggle the balance piece. But the phones really are part of what it means for us as educators, as us as people, to kind of participate in a space now where you think about the idea of, um, you know, just using these tools. And so within that, understanding that your school districts may have expectations of you, understanding that you as a staff member, you might have certain limitations, but sometimes some employees may kind of skirt that and be like, well, you know, I'm not supposed to take a photo, but I have my phone here, so I will. And then students, right? What are their role, rules and expectations in that space? And I want you to consider the idea of using these tools, balancing it out, and then at the same time, you know, think about the critical audiences you may have, whether it be employer, parents, or the general public as a whole. Because I guarantee if you Google teacher fired social media, you're going to find lots of stories. But the question is, how did that person get, unfortunately, into that situation? Was there just a simple policy that was not reflected? Or when it comes down to it, do we really not, do we need better rules in the classroom to really support kids in learning? So within that, I just want to highlight here a couple of things. Our new media behaviors versus our old ones. None of us were ever really kind of bringing an old camcorder into the, into the learning environment and recording everything kids do, but neither were they. And so these new media concerns come in with the idea of controlling the phone, limiting the use, kind of conflict pieces. Your teaching environment is one that you get to control. So if your school has a policy that needs to be followed about what kids in tech that can be the policy, but then again, where's the flexibility for it to kind of now start to change with emerging tech issues. But the thing is, is that when we think about the trends, we now know that kids using education technologies, technologies for purpose, or when it comes down to it, pro-social technologies, they're really thriving. And in that, what are the ideas of using these tools in healthier ways? Well, let's start with gaming. I'm a big proponent for gaming and education. Gaming itself is computer science. Gaming itself is participation. Gaming itself is art and design. And, and when it comes down to it, also you know, voiceover work and all these great things that kind of make a video game what it is. But just as a note, like gaming in the early, early 80s was very kind of, hey, your family has enough money to buy a gaming console. Hey, you got a, you got a second TV. Um, and in that, again, a, a very kind of, and socioeconomic benefit, meaning you have the money to spend. But when we consider the 90s, the 2000s, gaming becoming a little bit more accessible for all, we now have issues around whether or not gaming itself should be accepted as something that is participatory. And we have competitive gaming that leads to uh, winnings and play, but we're also eventually going to see esports and gaming as potential Olympic sports. And somebody will sit there and say, well, you know, playing a video game is not a sport. Okay. Hey, tell me how javelin is a sport. Yes, you're throwing a spear, but does that skill equate to anything else, right? Here in our connected world, gaming is 3D participation, 4D participation, um, learning and working from home. These are all places where young people come together and congregate. And in that, when we think about the inclusion and diversity and the representation, there is no male or female gaming, there's gaming. And so within that, this participation value about young people. I want them building video games. I want them taking their interest and applying it back to the classroom. So in Canada here, we've had a number of conversations around how gaming fits into curricula. And I want to highlight here in Saskatchewan, which is one of our middle provinces, um, you know, we have a number of students who are, are, are held back based on curriculum that was not built for them. Indigenous learners whose traditional lands were taken away, their, their, their tools and their supports of language were taken away, and, and atrocities of our past that really now are being corrected in certain ways, but not enough. But for this elder to recognize that, yes, young people in this community were having a hard time with curriculum that wasn't designed for them, he found that gaming was a way to meet the, cred cre uh, the credits, meet the credentials needed. And so communication over microphones, art and design and building a jacket or a video game that represented their participation in the space. These are the kind of things that I think really are that, that the negative that turns into a positive. Yeah, we don't want kids playing too many video games. Okay, but what if we get them playing video games in a different space, in a participation space, and then when they play a game, but they also learn how to build it. These are the skill sets that really do kind of get tested. And in that, during COVID, we also, we also saw a pivot. We saw the World Health Organization say, stay home, play video games, talk to your friends. We need you to stay home. 
And so all of a sudden, something that five years prior was, no, this is bad, don't do this. I want to highlight to you that a lot of gamers found successes in that space. And the idea of video game creation actually became something that was more employable from work from home than actually physically coming into a space. And so today, as we kind of edge towards this wrap up, I want to highlight to you that the good versus bad moralistic approach might be comfortable for some of us, but it's disconnected from the kinds of critical thinking we need in our, in our workforce that's evolving. We also need to consider the best interests of our realities of learners. And so I want to see kids painting on canvas. I want to see them creating using tools and mediums that are different, but also traditional in the same way. But what happens when a kid can take skills from a video game and apply it to 3D rendering and design a building, to design something that is going to move a, a group of builders into a space where they can take something from concept and turn it into something new? These are all the ideas that I really get excited about. So if I was building a home right now, I wouldn't want to just see the design and the draft. I want a 3D rendering of what it means to walk through the front door. I want to see what it looks like from a different vantage point. And I think when we look at our virtual realities or augmented realities, that's where young people are going to take us. And so today, as we consider how we participate, I want more parents, educators, and caregivers to reconsider approaches in the discussion. It isn't that the on-off switch isn't realistic. It's bedtime. It's bedtime. Here's how many hours you've been on this. You've met your limit. That's fine. I have no issue with that. But the boundaries and expectations do empower the younger child. As you kind of deal with the teenager, that young person who's about to foot out the door, where do we give them the tools to be better with these tools? And when it comes to the idea of, hey, you have a video game, but I don't know anything about it. What do you as the adult know about art, design, 3D rendering, computer science? Where can we then kind of harness that interest they have and turn it into an employable skill set? But when it comes to communications, I see these young people who build these amazing social media following. They're doing these great things. They're, yeah, they're doing the TikTok dances. But then I see parents and educators dismiss the value of what they do. Say, that's not going to get you a job. That's not going to turn into something. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, my dad had the same idea. The idea of what you do it has to turn into something that is employable. Well, our employment spaces change. Our workspaces change. And to be fair, those who were prepared to work from home during the pandemic, they became not only employable, but they benefited greatly. And so within that idea of where we are, what we're doing, I'm asking you as an educator, be reflective of your current social media use. Ask yourself, how do you choose to participate online? Where are the gaps in your knowledge? And then think about the young people in your home. What do they do online? Where's the divide in your own home when it comes to family participation? And now go to your classrooms. How can we use these young people to get us to a better spot using these great tools? And that's where I really, really want these young people doing great things, being, being not only empowered to do them, but also being supported. And so as I wrap, I want to highlight that the new media divide isn't one where there's an answer in an hour conversation. But I do encourage you as an educator to use some of the resources I provided. Reach out to me if you feel necessary. I'm more than happy to have conversations from afar about what's happening in your schools and maybe a different viewpoint may make it better for you. Or at the same time, you can correct me on maybe some of the things I've said today. But I very much value questions and your viewpoints because those questions themselves allow us all to become better learners. And the next time I do a presentation for any group, I want to take some of your insight into account because, again, I'm not in your classrooms. But the conversation we have today, I hope, I hope finds a place in your classroom to continue our dialogue from tonight out. So I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'm going to lean into our question period. All right. Thank you, Jesse, for sharing all of your ideas. Um, I do have a question about an example. So you talked about gaming and how that's like a good bridge in the classroom to sort of bring all of these things together that, that you mentioned. Is there any, a specific example you can think of where um, perhaps a teacher shared this with you, you know, a, a story that they, of what they did, um, really more focused around social media, because I know that that's sort of a hard one sometimes, especially yeah. with younger kids. And so I was wondering if you had any like concrete ideas that you could share with this group, perhaps so, some ideas that they could use in their classroom. Yeah, I'll give you an example. So I don't know if any of you remember a couple of years ago, but the kids were playing a video game called Fortnite. 
And they were all doing these kind of accessory dances that the characters did. And for those of you as educators, when you walked outside and you all saw them kind of moving their bodies around, like, what are they doing? And the response was Fortnite dances. Like, that became a cultural phenomenon based on the game. And in that, I had a colleague of mine who's, he's a gym teacher, but he's also a kinesiologist. And for him, body movement is a big part of why he became an educator. He wanted kids playing sports, but learning about how the human body reacts in certain places. And so in, in our community around December, kids do square dancing as part of the curriculum. It is horrible. You sweaty palms, you're, you're dancing to music that you're never really listening to, but it was something that was antiquated. And so he saw these kids doing the Fortnite dances and he thought about it and he said, listen, what I can do is we can set up a green screen and we can have the kids record themselves doing the dances. And then we can so superimpose the recording of their body movement to professional dancers and show what the dance looks like if you're moving your body in a controlled and practiced manner. And so over a period of about 21 days in all the gym classes, the kids worked on their dance moves. And then he recorded them in snippets and showed how they were improving in their body movement, how they were moving at, at, based on the inspiration of, of quote unquote, better dancers than them. And at the end, he was able to pre present his school district data and saying, if we take their interest, if we take the thing that's trending and we use the technologies that we already have in the school and we apply a learning lesson to it, not only will we meet the criteria for physical participation, but we're also gonna meet some of the criteria of digital participation. And we can start checking off some different boxes than just having them do square dances and do -si doing <laughs> So space, again, not necessarily a social media piece, but they took a trending thing from the internet, used YouTube video. And, and again, some people don't necessarily see YouTube as a social media, but very much is. And then kind of highlighted to kids, there are things you do here. We get it. You, you're all moving around like you got, you, you know, you, you're, you're full of energy, but let's kind of focus that. Uh, another quick example, and this is just one of social media. Um, there was a story at Washington State. This young woman um, was dealing with cystic acne, and she was showing young women how to do makeup tutorials with Instagram on how to cover the, the acne that she felt like other people might be dealing with, but she felt very isolated because of the severity of it. She, said, she then pivoted, and she started then creating Instagram accounts where it was not the idea of covering up the acne, but embracing it and saying, here's what I'm dealing with today. And I don't think I'm the only one in the world. Her social media account went from about 300 followers to about 36,000 in less than a year. And it showed that kids around the world who think that they're the only person in the day who's dealing with the severity of cystic acne and trying to figure out the layering, we're then starting their morning with, hey, look at the pimple of the day. You know, mine's as bad as yours. I'm not alone. And I think in certain ways, we all grew up with that idea of like, hey, I've got this thing going on in my face. I'm the, it's the worst you've ever seen. But the internet will show you there are different, obviously different levels of it. And if for these kids to harmonize their participation, to, to recognize that they weren't alone in the world, and whether that's, you know, how a kid fits into their community or how they see themselves or how they feel about their body or who they are, that community coming together very much is something that teachers and educators can kind of pull together and say, what can we do to help kids where we recognize the mental health issues best support them? Awesome. We have one more question before we end. Um, and I have someone that's asking your thoughts on high school teachers phone jail, expecting every student to put their phone in a pocket chart when they walk in the classroom. Yeah, I don't I don't like that teachers are tasked with this idea of policing the technology. And I kind of highlight it at the beginning of my presentation. Like if you were walking into your work experience uh, workplace and your, your employer, the principal said, all right, everybody, your phones in your cubbies. Um, are we are we regulating the distraction? Are we regulating the communication? Are we hoping that they're going to pay attention to us? Just as a quick note, I, I have a really simple technique for this. If you're looking for the win in your classroom, if your timetable is 80 minutes, I call this the 25, 25, 25, and then flex. Every 25 minutes of education, the kids get a couple minutes on their phones. The phones go away. You start your 25 minutes of education. Phones come out for a couple minutes, you wrap up the day, they close off until the bell with their phones. If any of them check their phones in between, you start to see this societal structure where they'll give each other nudges because they know that if they get caught on the phone, they lose that couple minutes of stretch time with their device. And the thing is, if we think about our own flexibility with it, we don't necessarily go an hour without looking at our phones. We try and check it on the side of our desk, 
we kind of we kind of allocate our own time to it. And employers are always kind of concerned, like, hey, we don't give cigarette breaks as much anymore. But what does it mean to give some downtime to check social media? And the thing here is that when we tell kids away, then they're using that small little gap they have between classes to really just kind of kind of address everything as fast as they can. And that's not the way the work world is set up. It's not necessarily the way that our functioning you know, relationships work. And more and more, I don't like the jail because we have to apply that to every aspect of our life or we're only going to regulate kids in that space. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jesse. Uh, I thank really you, appreciate you coming to talk with us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close up. Um, and so I'm going to share this last slide and share with you all of our uh, information on our last online guest speaker. So we have our last one scheduled for March 29th with Cindy Myers Foley, uh, the executive Dep the executive deputy director for learning and experience at the Columbus Museum of Art. Uh, Cindy will outline how teachers from all subject areas can apply the tools of art education to develop thriving cultures of creativity in classrooms and the entire school. She will demonstrate how the willingness to model curiosity and enable a type of thinking that imagines the world's possibilities can lead to a more beautiful, just, and equitable society. And then I also want to remind everyone that we do have online field trips, so you're welcome to join us online for uh, free interactive field trips with Getty Education or our Getty Educators. And um, it's basically a live Zoom session where you can explore pieces from the museum's collection through close looking, drawing, movement, and more. And then I just want to say thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your evening.